So if you now we move away this generational buck passing and this sort of quite colonial approach to passing on uh, to, to um, you know, taking up the carbon budget of other parts of the world, what would the UK's fair contribution to Paris start to look like? Now, to really understand that and go through it in some sort of depth, we have to go through all the science and the maths of climate change. Um, but we haven't got time to do all of that today. So instead of sort of that, we're going to think of it in terms of pies. So it's all about pies, which us Northern Man Mancunians quite like. Um, and you can sort of think about the carbon budget as a carbon pie. So we've got this big pie, 660 billion tonnes of it there or thereabouts. Um, and we've got to divide that pie amongst every country in the world. Not an insignificant uh, political challenge. Um, so what we've done in a, in a paper, which I'll give a reference to at the end, is we've looked at how you do split that up between the developing and the developed country parties, as they're called in Paris. And, and we've used a range of ways of doing this. You can do it on population, historical emissions, size of your economy. There's a whole set of ways you can split the pie up. And you don't get a single slice. You get a range of sizes of your slice, if you like. Um, and we've asked then, well, of the emissions for the wealthy parts of the world, how much should the UK get? And again, there, you use a range of ways to split that pie up to say, what should the UK's bit look like? And you know, to cut away all of the um, all the maths and assumptions behind this, you roughly get a range that looks something like 2.8 to 3.7 billion tonnes. Again, there or thereabouts. That's the total amount of CO2 that in the UK we can dump in the atmosphere, including aviation and shipping, but excluding imports and, and, uh, and exports. Now, that probably means very little to most of you, but that is nine years of current emissions. Nine years. So nine years from now, at the current emission rate, we would have blown through our carbon budget, our fair contribution to two degrees C warming. And bear in mind that two degrees C is not a safe threshold. Lots of people will die. They'll be poor, they'll typically be black, and they'll be living a long way from here. And they will have had almost no part of the problem. And we've known that for years, but to be brutally honest, we have not cared, hence our emissions just keep going, keep going up. So let's take that that budget. So what does that mean in terms of mitigation rates, in terms of how much we have to reduce our carbon dioxide every year? Well, very roughly, that's um, a reduction um, uh, of, oh, I'm gonna, I think I put it on here, yeah, so I put it on this slide here. I'm, I'm going to compare it with the, um, with the official version, the government's net zero um, legislation, indeed the Committee on Climate Change advice. So the total budget um, that, that, that they recommend is about 9 billion tonnes, ours is around about 3 billion tonnes. Mitigation rate, from the government about 5% per annum. Actually, if you want to deliver on Paris, about probably near a 10 to 20% per annum reduction rate. And remember, that's also hugely skewed to the wealthy of us who are responsible for most of the emissions, even in a country like the UK. If you play that out in terms of temperature, the current net zero or net not zero legislation is much more in line with two and a half to three degrees centigrade of warming, you know, a catastrophic change to our planet occurring in just 100 years, rather than say 1.5 or more realistically two degrees centigrade of warming that our much tighter budget requires, but 10 to 20% per annum reductions in emissions is, is a huge shift from any of the usual sort of um, business as usual mitigation we, we talk about. So if our preference is to ignore international equity, pass a huge burden onto our children to reduce or to suck our carbon dioxide emissions out of the atmosphere in the future, to be part of a 2.5 to 3 degrees C future and to renege on our Paris commitment. But in doing that, we can actually dovetail with today's politics we can maintain the current uh, market economic model, and we can, we can favour sort of, if you like, sizable adjustments to business as usual, but they're just adjustments to business as, uh, business as usual, not questioning it itself. Then, well, fine, stick with 5% mitigation and net zero by 2050. If alternative, our, our preference is to take our international obligations seriously, to have a huge mitigation effort uh, by this generation, not just passing it on to the next one, to cut our emissions in line with Paris, and to two degrees centigrade and therefore abide by the Paris commitments, then the repercussions of that are that we need a sort of, at the very minimum, a sort of an FDR, uh, Roosevelt scale sort of levels of government intervention. Now you may use market mechanisms, but the government will set the very strong umbrella framework within which that will operate. It will require a complete and, and profound reshaping of our current economic structures and deep and rapid shifts in, across all sectors. Now this is not a a moral position, it's not a political position, it's just a simple outcome of the maths and the science and our choice to do bugger all for the last 30 years on mitigation, then that is about a 10 to 20% per annum reduction in emissions year on year and real zero by about 2035, planes, trains, ships, everything. That's for the wealthy parts of the world. The poorer parts have about 15 years longer to do that. So to conclude, um, if you play out the maths and the science, then it, it tells you very clearly 
that what we need are new narratives on what constitutes growth, progress, and development. We've got to reframe concepts of value and even the idea of what, how we reward success, if we reward success at all. We need an alternative relationship with time where we're not just obsessed by the near term and discount the future. We need to genuinely embed intra and intergenerational equity you know, about care for our own children, our children's children, but also people elsewhere in the world. And we need a much deeper appreciation of the more than human world, of which, of course, we are part and are completely reliant upon. It's now 2020, coming to the end of 2020. Climate change has become system change. It wasn't initially, it wasn't in 1990, it wasn't in 2000. In 2020, we have squandered our carbon budget and now climate change has become system change. And as Einstein, um, as Einstein noted, but well, it's attributed to him anyway, um, uh, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And thus far, people of my generation have broadly just carried on doing exactly this and are passing this onto our children, the consequence of 30 years of ongoing insanity. So on that, uh, on that note, thanks very much for listening. And these are, this is a link to the paper that underpins the, uh, the science and the maths in this, in this presentation, and also to a more, perhaps a more interesting um, blog account or, um, that builds on the, on, the, uh, on the paper. So thanks again. Thank you, Kevin, so much. Well, I have to say, I've never been a lover of maths, but now I really don't like maths at all because that is just a whole lot of bad news. Um, but I, one thing, I agree with you. 30 years, we grown-ups have been knowing what changes are happening in our atmosphere and, and doing just not enough about it. I did... I've done one uh, stand-up comedy thing in my whole life and the whole premise for it was just this, that imagine if you worked on something for over 20 years as I did and in all the time you worked on it, it got worse. Like, mm. you know, what a failure. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we do, we need to do so much better. And, and, you know, you say 18 years left before we blow the carbon budget for two degrees. Well, I've read what two degrees is and it's not a world I want for me or my children. Um, so the, the, the absolute imperative to do more now and to do so in a fair and just way. Mm. Uh, obviously, I have a background in climate justice. So what you're saying just rings so true with me. We, we have to think about not our fair share of the effort, um, how other countries around the world are impacted, impacted and the consequences for future generations. Absolutely. Um, Kevin, thank you. You've given us an amazing call to action there. Baffled us. Uh, uh, with some maths, but um, translated those maths, I'm glad to say, into a really powerful, simple message that all of us can, can understand and take, and take away. Thank you, Kevin.